the way of work and going to propose a song with different than regular charity groups. So uh, I will just say a couple of words about myself. My name is Dmitry Leontiev. I work at Moscow State University. I'm professor of Moscow State University, Russia. And uh, I worked as a researcher and teacher in uh, many fields linked to personality problems, personality theories, personality assessment, general introductory course on personality and motivation and all this. And uh, also I worked, I did some uh, research work in such fields as psychology of arts and psychology of advertising. I uh, uh, did some uh, method, um, some technical work in uh, assessment techniques with assessment, personal assessment techniques. And then uh, uh, during the last several years, uh, m the focus of my interest switched into uh, existential issues, uh, mainly because, uh, well, I, mm, I have quite a, uh, quite a broad uh, vision of uh, all the spectrum of approaches to personality, and so I have a possibility to compare, and now I have the feeling that this is something very much up to date. Uh, a couple of years ago, I founded an institute in Moscow, an institute uh, of existential psychology and life enhancement. Uh, and the main task is uh, the integration of different versions and approaches within existential psychology and uh, integration of existential ideas with other uh, fruitful approaches within both academic psychology and practical psychology. In a more extended, in a more holistic context. So I, I wouldn't like to, uh, to do very long introductions. So I will try to well, I'll start with the key issues, with the key notions. Uh, I announced for this workshop uh, the, the, the notion of choice. <coughs> the point is, how do we choose? And can we learn to choose better? And what is better? And uh, it's uh, uh, why I don't use the screen and transparency, because uh, it's a very important point. When, well, a very interesting thing with human consciousness. We can do a lot of things without the uh, participation of our consciousness. Uh, by consciousness, I uh, I don't mean uh, here. Uh, and uh, what I mean by consciousness is first of all the unique, unique for human beings, unique capacity to uh, detach oneself from the stream of our life, from the stream of our behavior, from what is going on with us. Something, something is with us all the time. But we are not always involved into it. 
One, my friend, psychotherapist, or reported of a client, uh, of a client who told her once after the session. Now I understood the key question. The key question is whether I do live or my life leaves me. And probably this is really the key question not only for the, the, for, for the clients who come for therapy and for therapists themselves, but in principle this is the key question for any person. Now life life in general, life in the world is so well organized, at least in some parts of the, of the world, in the North America, life is so organized that we can, uh, we can let our life to li uh, leave us. Everything is already provided everything is where we can swim in this stream of uh, stimuli, in this stream of influences and there are uh, very many things that just allow us not to switch on our consciousness, not to switch on our conscious choice, meaningful action, to do without it at all. There are a lot of possibilities to live in a very simple way, not to, not to care at all. There is another way of living, another possibility, meaningful living. Uh, it's somewhat more complicated, most trainers more challenging, more enriching, and the results uh, cannot be compared according to the feeling of happiness or emotional satisfaction and so on. One can be quite happy or satisfied with very simple things. One need not create great works and to, or to establish very complicated relationships or make some important discoveries or travel to unknown exotic places in order to get a feeling of uh, satisfaction and even happiness. This can be uh, this can be uh, accomplished, this can, this can be uh, received in a much more simple way. But uh, one thing, there is one thing that cannot be, uh, uh, that uh, cannot be received, that cannot be earned without consciousness, without uh, uh, without choosing. This thing is meaning. In fact, we are choosing all the time. All the life is the constant process of choosing. Sometimes the choice is not especially important and has little consequences. We choose what to take for lunch, for instance. Sometimes the choice has a very far-reaching consequences for the whole life. When we choose a career, when we choose a spouse, or many cases. Uh, in some cases, uh, the choice is evident. 
but in many cases it is not evident and we must uh, take some effort to see that we do have the choice. A very uh, very uh, often we tend to deny the choice, the possibility of choice we have. Uh, let's take a very simple example. Why I'm here at this moment? So why won't I stop my talking and go away? Why? Are there some are there some causes that make me be here? And uh, correspondingly, why are you here? In fact, I can stop, finish the workshop and go away. There is nothing that would prevent me from doing this, except for some considerations that I consciously take, because I am aware about the I'm, I'm aware of the consequences of the price because in this case I, I have some goals, I have some wishes. I must do something in order to implement my goals, to fulfill my wishes. And if at this moment, if I stop the dialogue and go away, then, I, then my goals would not be reached. And uh, there will be some unfavorable consequences for me. This is no, nothing like a barrier. This is, this, this is, this is nothing like a, a ban. In fact, I can do it. Uh, uh, Probably I wouldn't do it, because uh, most important, more important for me, more preferable for me, would be to stay and continue this work. Some of you, uh, some of you don't stay here. Some of you leave this hall and go probably to another hall, probably somewhere else. There is this possibility always. The uh, uh, interesting thing with human choice, human motivation, the determination of our behavior at large is that uh, if we have some num a number of options, a number of imaginable options, we can uh, imagine in a given situation we can choose any of them. Uh, what I mean by this? Uh, there is a very mighty branch of the psychology of motivation. Uh, it started from the research on animals and we can take into consideration the strength of different motifs, uh, the environmental options, the uh, reinforcement, something like this, and we can, in, in, a, in a special, in, a, in any situation, we can calculate which direction an animal would take. This motif is stronger, then it will go this direction. This is stronger, this is better learned, this is more uh, reinforcing option, and so on, so on, so on. So, uh, when we take into consideration all the acting forces, we may see the logical result. But uh, with, uh, we humans rather often behave this way when our consciousness is off. 
when we represent the environment, we uh, make all the necessary all the necessary cognitive processes go on, but we don't uh, we don't do some uh, mental oper- we don't uh, well uh, we we are not uh, using what Frankel Victor Frankel called self detachment capacity. So uh, we we don't. Uh, uh, we cannot watch separate ourselves and the stream of our life and behavior. And in this case, it's the same as with animals. So uh, there are some motifs, some incentives that have different strength, different probability of uh, fulfillment of success, and uh, uh, making all the necessary calculation, we may successfully predict what direction a person will take and how the person would behave, what we will choose. If we know the criteria of choice, if we know the motifs involved, if we know the options. But an interesting thing is that when our consciousness is on, all this ceases to work because we can choose any option. There is, no, uh, there is no choice that could not be made when we do it consciously. We may choose the worst option. We may kill ourselves. We may become engaged to some self-destructive behavior. We may do a quite uh, stupid crony things that uh, that cannot be explained just the point that we can choose any option there are some mechanisms uh, some interesting mechanisms that uh, are recently studied in Russian and German psychology uh, in the context of uh, the mechanisms of volition uh, and there are some authors in Russia and in Germany. Uh, they uh, pointed out that volition is not a matter of power, will power. It's a matter of some fine, uh, some complicated mental technology of redistributing the motivational energy. When I take some volitional decision, it means, what must I do? So, uh, there is one uh, option with a strong urge, with a strong uh, incentive, natural strong incentive. There is other option with a weak incentive. I have some reasons to, uh, that uh, it would be good if I choose weak option. But I cannot just simply choose this weak option. I must add some motivational energy to it. What can I do? I can swear that, well, I promise someone, I promise you, I promise all the world, I promise my, uh, the significant persons for me that I do this at any price. When I, pr- when I have promised then another motif is added. The motif of my self-respect, of my uh, self-esteem. If I break the promise, if I would not fulfill it now, it's, uh, it causes some consequences for my self-respect. That's why the strength of this option increases. I may uh, uh, for instance uh, uh, well in uh, uh, in sports uh, well I have a friend who is uh, uh, now for this moment probably uh, number one sports psychologist in Russia, Rudolf Zagain, for instance, uh, he uh, at the uh, Olympic, Winter Olympic Games in Salt Lake City, 
he worked, for instance, with uh, Yagudin, uh, Olympic champion. Uh, she helped him in half an hour to overcome very serious crises and to win gold medals. And with some other uh, prominent athletes. And he has elaborated some techniques. One of them is the techniques of uh, uh, of uh, dedication. So, uh, when an athlete is going to start at some important competitions, uh, the psychologist proposes this athlete to dedicate this uh, his uh, or her uh, results to some significant person, to a friend, to a spouse, to a child, to someone. And uh, this also, this would give some additional motivation or energy to the efforts. This is the illustration of this redistribution. So, uh, what I'm, uh, what, uh, why I'm saying all this, just to show that when our consciousness is on, there is no choice that could not be made. We can choose any option. We can arrange our motivational processes in such a way that uh, these processes would justify any of the options. It's not just a, a cognitive process to find a reason to rationalize this option. No, it's some process of uh, real redistribution of energetic processes and increase or decrease in personal meaning of some options, of some directions. Of behavior. And uh, this capacity underlies the fundamental existential uh, peculiarity of human beings. That is recently usually described in terms of living, what it means to be alive. To be alive means to have all the time to have a possibility to change. I am alive if I can always be different, if I am not, not doomed to be all the time the same as I am at this moment. I can change. I can uh, do something different. The, and uh, as soon as I cannot be different, as I uh, feel that I am here and I will stay here and such and such, I am no more alive. As soon as I am completely uh, driven by some stereotypes, programs, mechanisms. They do work. There are a lot of stereotypes. There are a lot of programs in us. There are a lot of mechanisms, regularities, uh, conditioned responses, and so on. They do work. But we are something more than these stereotypes, these conditioned responses, these programs. We can switch off our consciousness and then at this moment we become nothing more than these stereotypes, responses and so on. But when we switch on our consciousness we we master them and we start to live. And when our consciousness is off, the life leaves us. It's a big difference. Yeah. Um, you speak of motivational energy. 
Um, I wanted to talk more what you mean by energy. Is it quantifiable? Mm -hmm. Are you referring to energy? Well, it's a good question. But the point is that if I would answer this question now, we would go probably a little bit too far. What I, uh, I, I, will, I will answer shortly. There is, uh, well, uh, on the conference website, meaning.ca, uh, you may find my paper from the previous conference, two, uh, two years ago, with uh, some general views on meaning regulation. The key idea is that meaning is not just a cognitive structure. It's something, it's uh, the uh, system, meaning provides us the system uh, that regulates our life, our behavior. And uh, there are some uh, energetic streams, uh, energetic components that are, uh, well, uh, what is meaningful for us brings some uh, energetic consequences. Uh, there are no ways for this moment to measure it exactly. Uh, I, uh, for today, I cannot tell you anything about the quantifiable thing. The point is that, uh, why, why I use this word here, just because, uh, well, I, uh, the sources of this, the, the source of this energy is uh, individual world relations. There are some, uh, some, uh, well, as probably, uh, now, now just I am, now I am uh, evidently speculating, but I will speculate a while. Uh, 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 so, uh, my feeling is that uh, there are some uh, bipolar tensions between individual and the world that can be, well, metaphorically, metaphorically compared to the uh, tensions between the uh, electric positive and negative poles. Uh, and uh, it's just this kind of tensions, this kind of relations that uh, uh, underlie the energetic side of behavior. It's not something, it's not purely inner sources, drives or something like this. When we abstract from the, we abstract uh, from the world, so we, we fail to find this, uh, the, the, the essence of human motivation. We must uh, take into consideration the individual world system. So it's just a pure speculation, but just to answer your question. Yeah. In relation to that, the bipolar tension, I would imagine that there's a bipolar tension also that's transcendent. It's like Jung speaks. There's the ego and the self-axis. So there's a, bi there's a bipolar tension that has to do with more mundane, and there's a bipolar tension having to do with the transcendence. Yes, there are very... very uh, well, uh, it's a too complicated statement to, to be agreed uh, as a total, not agreed. Well, I, I have... I, I can answer uh, that y I have the feeling that you, uh, uh, you've caught some important points and the direction of your associations, uh, I think it's, uh, it's quite an adequate direction and uh, it, will, it would, uh, uh, it would uh, uh, go the right way. But uh, the, the question is too much complicated, I wouldn't like to uh, to tell too, too many, to, uh, uh, to too many uh, speculative statements. Just a minimum of them. Just a minimum of them. So I, I would like to now to, to proceed to the issues of choice, uh, because uh, well, about non-evident, about non-evident choices. There were uh, uh, why are you here? In fact, uh, 
And why, uh, the point is not only why I'm here. The traditional, the, the difference between existential approach to human choosing process and traditional academic approach to decision making is uh, probably the most important difference is that the uh, traditional approach, approach, yes, all of them, in fact, they uh, calculate, they take into consideration only the uh, attractiveness of different options, uh, the possible gains. But the point is that for every choice we have to pay. Every choice has its negative We reject some other options all the time. We can do without it. Are you saying that that's the uh, I I am saying that this is the main the main difference between the existential position regarding the problem of choice and decision making and traditional position. Yes in this context. It's not the, the, the main feature of existential approach at large. Yes, it's important, but it's not the, the, the only problem. It's not the, the most important probably point, but it's most important point regarding the issue of uh, choice and decision making. And this is something we tend to uh, we tend not to see, we tend to suppress, we tend to deny. Uh, probably, well, an interesting thing, if we had more time, if we had more time, uh, I would ask you to write an autobiography in negative terms, which options in your life, which alternatives in your life you have ever rejected during your life course. What's the main difference between those two approaches? between the traditional approach and academic, or well, traditional academic approach and existential approach. The main difference, in fact, is that when we calculate the gains, the attractiveness of different options only, there is an illusion that there is some objective measure attractiveness, objective measure of preference, so we can really do some, just where to solve the task, which, the, which of the options is the best. There is an illusion that there is a best option and we <coughs> must only properly calculate it. But if we, if we consider the price, and I will, the whole, the whole day, the whole uh, morning today, I will speak about the price. Uh, when we consider the price, we will see that choice is always a personal process. A process with personal responsibility, because to pay the price is always a voluntary act. When I see that there is some necessary price, I must accept it. I must agree to pay this price. That's why uh, that means that I would take the responsibility for this choice. 
Is it possible at all to make a better choice? How do we know which choice is better? We can now make an experiment, make this choice and trace the consequences, then come back again, make other choice and trace the consequences, and then to compare. It's impossible. So the point is that uh, even, even in retrospect, we can never say whether our choice already done was right or wrong. There is no way to check it. We may say that the choice was uh, was okay. So nothing, nothing wrong happened. Nothing, no especially uh, awful consequences. But probably another choice would be much better. We don't know. We may tell that this, that's the choice already made. Uh, has uh, brought some very awful and unpleasant consequences. But probably another option would be still worse. We don't know, we cannot be sure. One of the greatest illusions is that uh, any choice must, well, if we uh, do some right choice, some perfect choice, everything will be okay. So we tend not to see, uh, we tend not to see uh, that there, there will always be, there must very often be some negative consequences and you see uh, uh, it, it seems to me that uh, uh, the situation It seems to me that Ambrose Bierce said that inescapable situation, inavoidable situation, is the situation uh, uh, which has some uh, solution, some exit that we, by any reasons, don't like. That's the inescapable situation. In fact, uh, there are always some things that we don't like and we try to do without the consequences we don't like. But in life it's uh, not so often possible. The point is we cannot do always the best choice. What we can do is to accept the price and together with the price to accept the responsibility for the choice. What, uh, what is uh, the point, uh, why the people suffer most often in the situation of choice? Uh, the, uh, there are some unpredictable, well, more, more exactly to say, unpredi non, uh, unpredicted, uh, unforeseen consequences. And, uh, well, I made this choice. Uh, some unforeseeable, unpleasant consequences has, uh, have come. And I feel that, well, I must have done the wrong choice. Or uh, I am I'm guilty, I did the wrong choice. Or someone is guilty, someone has uh, pressed to me, someone has made me to do this choice still worse, or both, both worse. So, uh, uh, I, uh, the, 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 the most 
the, mo the, the most, uh, 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 the main source of suffering is just that we, we deny our responsibility, our authorship, our own choice. Just because we don't want to foresee probable, to foresee the price, the price we have to pay. Yeah, it's not a matter of uh, it's not a matter of imagination alone. So imagination is a very important thing in all the meaning related uh, processes. Uh, the point is uh, that we have not only to imagine different options, but to accept that we are choosing it. So the point is the personal responsibility for the choice. We cannot, uh, when we understand that we have to pay for this, well, you go to this workshop and you, you, you are hesitating between two workshops, you decide to go to this workshop rather than to next workshop or to the beach. And uh, you understand you don't, uh, you don't uh, uh, try to convince yourself that this is the, definitely the true choice. You see that uh, uh, what you do is that you become aware that several options are possible. If I have this, I miss that. If I have that, I miss this. And it's a, that's me who decides what to pay and what to get. And uh, after this, you may, well, the workshop is over. You uh, uh, can do some retrospective evaluation. Okay, I, I did the right choice, or I did the wrong choice. I should have go to other room. But uh, if you try to persuade yourself, to convince yourself uh, from the beginning that's uh, what I need, definitely, I know. And then uh, you come to, to this room and you leave disappointed. Something is wrong. Why? I should have get the best option. I did not get the best option. Why? Who is guilty? Me or the conference organizer because they did not give enough information or something else. But there can be no right or wrong choices in this situation. There can be only personal choices. In each case, you have to pay something, to miss something. In this case, you have to pay with some opportunities, possibilities that uh, you may choose only one of the possibilities. And now I'm coming to the point of different, different currencies in which you, uh, you may pay for your choices. Yeah, please. Uh, you mentioned that we have to understand that there is a price to be paid when we make a choice and there would be, for some reason, uh, 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 some occurrence of some kind or another within us. What about thieves? Mm -hmm. Thieves. Or, or that have that kind of a mindset that they would take without without paying, without the price. 
does that have to do with responsibility? Well, I think it's uh, it's uh, uh, good for uh, uh, it, it would be it would apply to everyone and to this as well. You see, it's very often that we try to deny. Uh, the possibility of choosing. We, we say that, oh, I could not do other way. Oh, they made me to, to do this. They compelled me. I had no other choice. I had no options. So this is the psychology of a slave. I had to. I couldn't do another way. So, in uh, urban Yalm, in such cases, advised uh, in a uh, psychotherapeutic situation to, uh, to, to try to make the client to reformulate all the, all the uh, statements that start with I must to the statements that start with I will, I wish, I want. I must so I must go to to, to, uh, to this lecture I must go to this event uh, I want to go to this lecture I want to go to this event probably I don't want we must check it whether I want it and it's uh, very often uh, the excuse you see, an, an interesting thing, uh, an interesting thing uh, uh, noted by a great Russian existential philosopher, Mirab Mamardashvili, uh, that uh, when we speak of some, of some uh, crimes, of some uh, social deeds, we very often refer to the conditions, to the circumstances, and we trace uh, the, the causes uh, in these uh, external conditions and we can say, so this and this system of factors, of causes, caused me to, uh, to, to steal, uh, to kill or something else. But we can never apply these kind of explanations to good deeds. someone that figures that they can take of the time and they don't have to pay. That doesn't, that, that someone that doesn't see that aspect of having to pay, uh, you, you take something without paying. Is, is this okay. account, inaccountable? Okay, I'll, 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 I'll say it very soon, very soon. So, uh, uh, about what I was uh, saying that uh, when we are doing something good, some charity, some, uh, well, something that is not, uh, that, that goes from our uh, heart, from our highest uh, concerns, we can never uh, point to the causes, to the factors, what made us to do this. No kind of this explanation is possible for, for the good reasons. The good cannot be explained in such a way. Because it's something freely chosen, only freely chosen. And it's rather easy for us to accept that the good things we do are freely chosen. They stem from us, from us as agents, as subjects, as persons. But we still try to deny that the not so good actions also stem from us, from the same source that I choose. So if I'm working with somebody doing some therapy with somebody and they have some bad behavior quotes, I often ask them what would be a good reason for doing that mm -hmm. in order to get to take responsibility for what they're doing. Freely chosen. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, Thank you. I would add something to it. Uh, I would add that we often, so the choice, uh, the choices we made, we, we often choose the way of living. We choose, so to say, we choose ourselves. We choose to be a definite kind of persons and to live a definite kind of life. And then we start some programs, some stereotypes, and we uh, we are inclined to continue. It's a self-sustained process, like this. So, uh, so the the robber has chosen some way of life and never takes into consideration the alternatives. So the choice is very often the choice of some whole way of living. A very interesting example I found also in Irwin Young's Existential Psychotherapy. Uh, a very amazing example about a businessman who often uh, who often flew to different cities for a business and uh, it was a rather young man and uh, he had uh, 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 girlfriends in every big city old uh, friends so uh, to uh, and spent uh, time with them and then she, she, uh, once he he has come to New York for a business in the evening uh, took his telephone book called to a girlfriend and this friend answered oh uh, glad to hear you but I'm sorry this uh, this night I'm busy so I had some uh, this and this well he called another one the same result he called the third one also some coincidence uh, no one can uh, join him to, to, to spend time together and when he uh, called several friends and his list was over and no one could join him he suddenly felt a great relief because he did not want it in fact he realized that it was not something he did want to, to, to spend the evening with, with a girl in fact what he would do most eagerly now is to to prepare for the meeting next morning and to uh, go to bed early and to, to, to have a good rest and that's what he does really want but he was behaving according to a stereotype to his self-sustained way of living and uh, uh, only after uh, only when this stereotyped way of living met uh, so become frustrated and met uh, the, the, uh, those obstacles only then he could realize what did he really wish so the point is that we uh, tend to so there is one of the very one of the mightiest motivations in human life at all just to, to, to maintain status quo and this is also uh, this is also true for robbers. This is true for, 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 for scholars and for businessmen and for robbers. It's uh, because it's always 
easier to maintain the status quo than to change uh, to change anything. So it's so attractive, it's so tempting to leave everything as it is. When I said that human being can always be different, they really can always be different, but not so many of us are aware of this possibility and consider, seriously consider this possibility for themselves. I need not introduce some great substantial changes in my life. I may keep the same, but if I keep in mind the possibility that everything can be different, then I'm already the master of my life, however stable it could be. My life could be very stable and regulated, but if I keep in mind the possibility of changing it, and if I consciously choose that it should stay as it is, then it's me who lives rather than my life leaving me. Yeah. Well, there are distinctions. Decisions are not always large. They can be very small. Yeah. So your life may seem to be very stable. Mm -hmm. You may be making decisions all the time anyway, smaller decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, indeed. So uh, certainly because we, we, uh, we uh, the choices can be big and the choices can be small, so uh, very, very important thing. So uh, I can, I can, uh, well, my own experience, a beggar asking money, so to give or not to give, a small choice, it's not a big problem to give or not to give. And there are some, there are some reasons, so in Moscow, for instance, there are plenty of false beggars. It's just a kind of business. I, I think everywhere. Well, and uh, the point is that uh, I, I, uh, I, I have a natural uh, readiness, inclination uh, to, to give some money to, to, to a true beggar, to a person who's in need, but I don't like uh, to, to give money uh, to this uh, beggar businessman. Well, but uh, it's, uh, but how can we, how can we know exactly? So it's the, the problem, if, 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 if we, we, we can always, uh, we have a possibility of mistake. And the, the only point is, the only, for me, the only point, the only way to solve this problem is, well, uh, not to said so I, I give uh, I give this coin to this man because he looks like a true beggar or I don't uh, give this uh, a coin to this man because he looks like a false beggar due to, due to this and this uh, uh, signs but the only point is to refer to oneself I give to I give money because I feel like giving money, and that's what I want now to give money. Because uh, to try to refer to the science that would help me to decide whether he is a true beggar or a false beggar, it would be it's an illusion. It's again an illusion. Uh, what is real in this situation is my own decision. In fact, it does not depend much on the science. Because we do it for ourselves. We do it uh, in order, uh, well, uh, in order to, to, to get some, well, to provide some internal state. We do it for self-satisfaction, for the feeling of some uh, accomplished values, or something like this. Because it's in line with our image 
of ourselves, with our self-image. For this moment, I am the person who gives charity. For this moment, who does not give the charity. It's the, uh, the uh, which which self do we choose at this moment? We choose this self or this self. We choose our self. And when the retrospective evaluation go back almost to a core fundamental belief as to whether we have propensity to do good or evil, could you talk about each of your accept things that are freely chosen, that are good, and we can take responsibility for that, which would align with the belief that we have propensity to do good, and the things that are poor or lesser good choices, we deny the responsibility, and if we align ourselves with a propensity to do evil, then we're looking at external motivational energies that are influencing us. Yeah, we deny that it goes from us. We deny that it goes from us. We, uh, there are, in fact, I, I, in fact, there are always many kind of pressures, and we may uh, we may conform, conform to this pressure. There is a fact, a fundamental fact, that there is plenty of pressures and influences uh, acting upon our decisions, upon our behavior, upon our choices. It's a fundamental fact. There are. True. The second fundamental fact is in, the, in case of criminals, in case of thieves, in case of robbers, uh, the urge to steal, the urge to maintain this way of living, is a very mighty uh, force, is a very mighty pressure, but it's not the only one. In the world we live, there are many pressures that push us in different directions. Why did he choose this one? Probably because, well, the most common question would be, well, the, the most common answer would be that because it's the way of the least resistance. The way of the least resistance is to switch off the consciousness. And then the mightiest pressure would win. And usually in these cases the pressure, uh, the pressure of uh, uh, maintaining this criminal way of life is the mightiest if we ascribe them some absolute uh, measure of intensity. In this case, so, if you switch off your consciousness, as it is often the case, it's natural to maintain this way of living. But we can switch it on. And then nothing becomes determined. And then nothing becomes uh, definite. So, uh, in a sense, uh, well, uh, well, there was a wonderful saying by Hegel that uh, what that is probably the, the the core of the whole human psychology. Hegel said to a uh, hundred years ago, uh, uh, that uh, circumstances and urges motivate us in as much as we allow them to do this. And there are two great truths in this saying. First, that they can really motivate us in many cases. 
And second truth is we have the possibility not to allow them to motivate us. Yeah. Um, in this, I wonder if you could address that, you know, what I sense you're talking about is <clears throat> to act in good faith or bad faith, which has nothing to do with a moral, religious, fundamental sense of what's good or bad. It's just deciding to become it. To deciding to become, in other words, I can choose uh, not to respond to the mundane or to respond to a transcendent function. So what I want to say is this. I find myself struggling with, uh, and listening to this gentleman's comments, if I understand you right, is it a matter of that I'm choosing good that helps me to refer to the transcendent, or is it just in the act of becoming? that when you choose not to respond to the mundane, it refers you to a world that, um, it refers you, it, you, you refer to a point that is inherently good. It's not like there's a choice to be good. Am I being clear? Because I'm struggling with that myself. I can answer this. It's a very, very important point, and I can answer it the following way. So, you see, the religion, the, the idea of God is something very, uh, something very important in our choices, in, the, uh, in uh, our behavior, as a very mighty factor mediating our behavior, something that helps us to control ourselves, to mediate ourselves. But the idea of the faith, the idea of uh, some uh, ultimate source of good and bad, of decision, of truth, and so on and so on, it may act in uh, quite contradictory ways. For the persons who tend to deny their personal responsibility for what is going on with them, it helps them to deny their personal responsibility. Why? It's not me. Everything is predetermined. Everything is prescribed. What can I do? Everything in God's hands. For those who tend to take the responsibility for their own choice, the idea of God helps them to become responsible for their choice. Because I see, I see that there are a lot of factors that cause me to, uh, to behave in a way of least resistance, in a simple way, uh, well, not to strive to anything, but besides this mundane, there is also some higher reality, and because there is some higher reality, and we must keep, we'll keep God in, in mind and in heart, and so I will, I will not conform to all these pressures. I should not conform to all these pressures. I should decide myself. So, th this, so there can be, so there is faith and there is pain. The result can be quite different, contradictory. Ah, because uh, not to use overhead projector, just because uh, it would help if I would use it. It would uh, serve to switch off your consciousness. Because uh, only in a living dialogue it can be switched on. When I present some pictures, well, and in fact, it's, it's an awful thing of all the contemporary mass culture, visual, visual culture, because uh, it supports, or well, mass culture supports the subhuman ways of behaving, supports the switching, switching off our consciousness, supports uh, letting us free of the decisions and uh, getting rid of personal responsibility. And it's a very a very sad uh, thing and a very serious challenge, perhaps the most important challenge of all. 
And uh, Joseph Brodsky, the Nobel Prize winner, said that uh, the bad, bad literature is our metaphysical enemy. Because it's something that, that, that is against our development, against our growth. That is a very, very awful, uh, very awful thing with respect to our growth. So, shall we make a, a break? Short break? Okay. Then, uh, well, uh, ten minutes, I suppose. Yes, and then we continue. Mm -hmm. of the workshop. So, now the next, the next key point is how we pay. How we pay this price. The, uh, we usually know we usually consider rather few ways of payment. We tend to neglect many aspects of price we do pay for our choice. There are several different currencies in which the price may be calculated. And perhaps one of the most important thing, things is to learn to see all those dimensions of price. Uh, the first most evident way the first most evident kind of currency in which we make our payments is resources. For, we pay by our resources for some choices. We invest money, we invest time, we invest health. Some resources we do have, we pay for getting some results for providing some choices. It's rather evident thing, I don't think we should uh, uh, dwell on it. Different kinds of resources, one price. And usually, if we pay in these terms, in money, or something like this, it's the cheapest way of paying. It's the best bargain. The second, the second way of payment, the second currency, I also mentioned it, it's possibilities. When the choice is made, one possibility, one option is chosen and all the others are closed. Sometimes forever, sometimes for for some period, but they don't exist anymore, the possibilities. It's, uh, it's always the case, uh, it's very pleasant to have the, uh, the consciousness, to, 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 know, to know, to see that we have so many possibilities. All the world is open, but uh, and uh, uh, that's why it's so hard to make a choice. Because as soon as we make our choice, no possibilities are left. We enter a new situation with a new set of possibilities. So probably the. Uh, well, I would say that the concept of situation is defined through the set of possibilities. What is the borderline between one situation and other situation? The change in possibilities. When the set of possibilities has changed, then we, that mean, it means that we enter the new situation. Well, it's a formal criterion. Well, not so formal because it's not so easy to describe formally 
the poss all the possibilities, but in principle it's something that can define, can help us to define the, the notion of situation. Uh, the third point, the third kind of currency is reputation, image, social status. It's something we, well, all those currencies can be also used for the calculation of gains. But I would not dwell on the calculation of gains because it's a rather common thing. I would prefer to focus on price. Uh, so we may, uh, we may, uh, deny some, we may, uh, we may risk, uh, we may risk uh, to, uh, to get some uh, not so good impression in, in the eyes of others, or we may make a choice that would uh, on the contrary, that, that would uh, bring the gains in terms of reputation, in terms of image. And this is also one of the things that is certainly, no one of those currencies is absolute, has an absolute value. All of them are important to some degree. The next point, the next currency, is mental states. We do a lot of things in order, for instance, to reduce our anxiety. And staying with the anxiety is a very important price as existentialists know long ago, uh, since long ago, uh, price for the possibility to making our own choices. It's the price for freedom, because the future is unpredictable. We are not gods. The future is never foreseen. We may, uh, we may uh, build some assumptions, some hypotheses in terms of personal constructs and implications and my George Kelly. But it's just the hypothesis. Nothing more. We can never make real predictions. We can always uh, we are always uh, uh, well we must keep in mind the possibility to make a mistake. Human being is a being doing mistakes, and it's impossible not to do the mistakes. So it's something we must accept. We can, and it, it's it's a very important point of our responsibility to 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 consider the probability of a mistake.